world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. I'm one of those uh, journalists that quite likes to go off piste, as it were, um, and that's what we're going to do a little bit this morning. I mean, obviously, there are lots of big stories to talk about with you, which we may get to. Um, but we discovered something yesterday, which was quite shocking about the NHS. Now, we know that the NHS is not fit for purpose in an awful lot of areas. But what I didn't know personally until yesterday is that every single hospital, it would seem in these aisles of ours, is still operating as if COVID is a massive, dangerous uh, disease that can kill loads and loads of people. They're only allowing one person in for one hour a day to visit sick relatives, dying relatives, relatives in comas. I mean, it's quite disgraceful what's going on. It's completely disgraceful and it's inhumane and it's just plain nasty. That's how I would put it. And 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 it's incredibly cruel to deprive people who are either very ill or maybe in the last... Uh, a few days of their lives to to deprive them of the right to see their family, to see their loved ones, to hold someone's hand. And I think that the the real issue here is the way in which the NHS is viewed these days. It's viewed increasingly as the national religion. Mm. We're not allowed to criticise it. During the pandemic, we all were told to stay at home to save the NHS. It was basically like worshipping some new sun god. You know, you have to make all these sacrifices to please the god. And, and that's how it's treated. You know, it's a very, it's it's a kind of sanctified institution that is held up as this saintly, wonderful uh, organization that no one is allowed to criticize. And as a result of that, it kind of gets away with anything that it wants. And that's why I think it's incredibly important to put pressure on the NHS and the people who run it to answer questions about why they're still behaving as if there's a pandemic on. Absolutely right. Well, our first uh, sort of a conversation yesterday was with a, a businessman called Bernard Smart so I personally know, uh, who was trying to see his own son, who had tried to take his own life. Um, he had his own problems. He was asked uh, to leave the hospital when he started question- questioning uh, who was responsible for making this decision, that only he, for one hour, could go and see his own son when his uh, his ex-wife was not allowed in because she had already been had her place taken, as it were, uh, by the father. And he was told, basically, we're not going to give you any information, we're not going to tell you who's responsible, and if you don't leave the premises, we're going to escort you out through security. I mean, it's really disturbing to treat people like that who are not committing any kind of offence, but just want to visit a family member who's in distress or who is unwell. And I think it's almost like what the NHS is doing is is rationing love. You know, it's basically saying to patients, there's only a certain amount of time you can have with a visitor. There's only a certain amount of visitors you can have. We're going to ration those engagements and decide who can come in, when they can come in and how many can come in at the same time. And those kinds of judgments, I don't think it's right for the NHS to make them. We are getting through the pandemic. COVID's coming back in some ways, but it is now a manageable virus. And there have been manageable viruses in our communities for centuries and centuries. So to act as if we're still in an emergency that needs special rules, it's just wrong. And in these kinds of instances, it's also cruel. It really is. And uh, we've been asking for the last 24 hours now, practically, for a statement from um, the Sunderland Health Trust, uh, for a shortened version of its real name. One of the things we learned yesterday was that in the last four or five years, they've changed their name about four or five times, which means every time they change their name, they change all the signage, they change all the headed note paper, they change all the signs inside the hospital, outside the hospital, spending a fortune, right, on things which are not necessary and things which are not required. We also learned today uh, that NHS trusts are issuing instructions to all of their various clinical staff to make sure they ask men if they're pregnant before they have a scan. I mean, it's as though some maniac has taken hold of this place and turned it upside down. Oh, completely. And I just wonder what, you know, the vast majority of people think when they see this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, one thing that people always say about the NHS is that it's underfunded. My view is that it's got plenty of money. It's got it's sloshing with money, yeah. but it spends it on stupid things. You know, it's, a load of it is spent on the clipboard class, you know, mm. the managerial class who manage things that probably don't really need that much management. So they get paid a huge amount of money. And then there are these stupid initiatives about um, being politically correct, being woke, making sure the right words are said. Make um, I wonder how many diversity officers the NHS has, for example. So it spends a lot of money on things that are unnecessary, whereas it should just be spending money on doctors and nurses and medicine and making people well when they are ill. That's what the NHS should do. But it's become this kind of 
political organization that also wants to correct our thinking as well as mend our bodies mm. and that really is not the job of the nhs it really isn't and they have been sort of gripped haven't they by this sort of advisory role that they would like to take so in effectively if you've got something wrong with you don't go to the gp surgery because you might infect people with some kind of illness i mean what do they think um, people go to a GP surgery for. You don't go to a GP surgery, there's nothing wrong with you. You go when you're sick. And if the GPs in this country don't want to catch a disease, maybe they shouldn't be doctors. You know, it's it, the, the GPs, I think, have really let themselves down over the past two years. They just haven't played the role they should have played, which was being, you know, being there for the communities, for sick people, helping people in need. GP services just stopped in many instances, and uh, I had to have a, a consultancy with the GP, GP during the pandemic, and I did it through a computer. Where I had to pick up all these gadgets. Someone on the other end of the computer was telling me to pick up a gadget, put it in my ear, stick it down my throat. It was an incredibly disorientating mm. experience. I and bet. That went on for way too long, and it's still going on in many instances. People need these kinds of health services. More to the point, we pay for them. We pay for the health service. We expect it to be of good quality, and we expect it to treat us with respect. And that very often is not the case. Too often, the NHS either treats us like uh, annoyances, you know, why are you coming into this doctor's surgery? Do you really need an appointment? Or it treats us as these ill-educated, stupid, regressive people who need to be told how to think about all sorts of issues. So the NHS has lost its way. It's become a hectoring organisation and it really needs to have a word with itself. It really does. But I mean, we do have a lot of these conversations, Brenda. This is a particularly irksome one for me because I think to, to, to deny people the ability to hug their loved ones in, in some cases before they die because they won't be able to see them ever again outside of the hospital when they'll, they, they just won't be around anymore. You know, this is particularly awful, but it seems to me that nobody really has the courage to admit this in, in public. And I include in that even the, gov the Conservative government of this country, who are terrified of being accused of privatising it, terrified of being accused of being the cruel Tories. You know, the people who are cruel here are not the politicians, it's the people running the NHS. Yeah, we, and we really need to think about that because, you know, I remember the Labour Party a few months ago put out a tweet in which they were basically talking about how hard nurses had it during the pandemic. Now, I have no doubt that frontline nurses worked incredibly hard during the pandemic uh, to save lives and to look after sick people. No one would doubt that. But this tweet that they put out was from a nurse saying the hardest thing I had to do was to send away a man who was weeping and wailing in the car park because he couldn't see his dying wife. Mm. And I thought to myself, this doesn't do what you think it does. This doesn't show how wonderful nurses in the NHS are. This shows how cruel and insane our institutions went during the lockdown and how they completely lost the moral plot, lost any sense of humanity. And to have a, a, a member of the NHS saying that she basically watched as a man was screaming and weeping in a car park and refused to allow him to see a dying a loved one is just disgusting actually and if we carry on those habits those inhumane habits into the post-covid era everyone will lose out and everyone will lose faith in the nhs good talk, Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. talk radio. listen on your smart speaker watch it live on your smart tv the world headquarters of common sense talk radio